Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2DCC webinar series. I'm Kevin Dresser, the Operations Director for 2DCC. Today we have Dr. Saptarshi Das from Penn State University. Dr. Das used to be a user of the 2DCC as a local user, and now he is one of the core faculty of the facility. He's an Associate Professor of Engineering Science and Mechanics, and today he's going to talk about sort of this neurobiological inspired um, you know, sensing, computing, and storage paradigm that they've been coming up with. Um, so Dr. Das, please go ahead. Hey, thank you, Kevin. And uh, thanks again for the invitation. Uh, this is an excellent platform to uh, talk about the research uh, that we are trying to do in order to accelerate the development of two-dimensional materials. So, uh, so primary focus of my research group is to look into the next generation of uh, smart devices for sensing, computing, storage, uh, as well as for hardware security. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, but before I uh, get started, uh, first, I would like to acknowledge uh, all the, uh, the funding agencies, uh, of course, including 2DCC. I, I'm also funded by NSF through the Early Career Award. Uh, I was funded using uh, the Young Investigated Award from AOFSR. And apart from that, uh, my group uh, is also getting support from ARO, uh, DITRA, uh, and uh, various other you know, private and federal organizations. So. Uh, of course, I would like to acknowledge also the wonderful facilities uh, at the Material Research Institute, where we do all our research, uh, as well as my department, uh, my home department, uh, Engineering Science and Mechanics. Uh, uh, and uh, no research can be done without having a group of motivated, hardworking, and uh, uh, really brilliant uh, graduate students. So I'd like to acknowledge them all. Now, uh, to get started, I think uh, for the 2DCC, uh, we do not need to really uh, uh, invoke more interest uh, in 2D materials. Uh, uh, it has been a revolution for the last decade. Uh, of course, it all started with graphene uh, and then kind of uh, branched out into these uh, semiconducting 2D materials, which primarily interest us because we are a device group. Uh, uh, there has been a lot of work based on exfoliated materials in the early days um, uh, with various uh, semiconducting uh, transition metal dichalcogenides. Uh, uh, and uh, given uh, the uh, very interesting results that these devices have demonstrated, uh, uh, really uh, the 2DCC uh, uh, accelerated uh, the large area growth of these 2D materials. Uh, my wonderful colleagues uh, from 2DCC, Dr. Tyrannis, Dr. Robinson, and Dr. Redwing, uh, did uh, are all the pioneers in the field of growing these 2D materials of a large area. Uh, and we grow multiple different 2D materials on different uh, growth substrates at a wide range of growth temperatures, depending upon the thermal budget of the, uh, the process or the technology that we are trying to develop. And then once they grow these materials, so we uh, generally use a transfer technique to transfer the material from the growth substrate uh, onto the device fabrication substrate. And then we do a lot of characterization, which includes AFM, XRD, Raman, PL, and eventually we kind of make our devices. Now, what has been really uh, uh, pushing forward this 2D material is uh, not only the large area growth, but also the fabrication of hundreds and thousands of these devices, and then trying to benchmark their electronic properties. Uh, uh, for example, we have uh, now really studied MOS2 and WS2, uh, scaled them down to a channel length of 100 nanometer, and look into hundreds of these devices and find out the different uh, statistical distribution of critical electronic parameters such as you know threshold voltage, subthreshold slope, uh, interface trap densities, uh, on off ratio, mobility, as well as the contact resistance. So, uh, so there has been a lot of progress that has been made within these two uh, D FETs. So, uh, now going from single devices or even benchmarking multiple uh, devices, uh, we are also trying to make integrated circuits. And as you know, that the integrated circuits have developed at multiple stages. It starts all with small scale integration, where you start making this different logic gates by combining you know, less than 10 transistors. And that is what we call small scale integration or SSI. And we have now been able to demonstrate most of the logic gates and or ZOR, and even you know, a little bit bigger circuits such as multiplexers, ring oscillators uh, using our 2D FET. So, now going forward, you know, you wanted to essentially integrate uh, more than 10 devices. And when you go in the range of, you know, 100 to 1000 devices, we start calling it large scale integration or LSI. And within, uh, by using these two devices, we have now been able to create these vision chips comprising of 900 devices and the crypto chip which comprises of 200 uh, uh, FET. So, uh, and this simply shows that, you know, we are no longer stuck into measuring a single device or a few device, we can now start measuring really large scale integrated circuits 
using this 2D material. So, but our ultimate aim is to go towards very large scale integration or VLSI of this 2D FET. So, uh, and in a recent article, which uh, I wrote uh, with a lot of my colleagues, uh, uh, pretty much across the, the entire planet, you know, I mean, you can see the names of the people uh, who are uh, distributed across US, uh, in UK, Europe, uh, uh, India, China, uh, and people from industry, academia, national labs. So we came together and write, wrote this uh, review article uh, on the prospect and challenges that is uh, existing with the 2D material or very large scale integration of this 2D material. So I'm going to highlight some of those challenges and uh, kind of talk about uh, where do we stand today and what still needs to be done in order to meet the International Roadmap for Devices and Systems or the IRDS uh, benchmarking uh, for scaled FETs uh, uh, by the year 2028. Um, so these are the critical requirements uh, for the IRDS, uh, starting from you know the thickness of the channel material to the contact resistance, the channel length on current, off current, and uh, at the end of the day, device reliability. Now, of course, when we are using a monolayer of uh, 2D material, uh, we immediately meet the need uh, for the thickness of the channel material. This is something silicon cannot really achieve uh, uh, because of scaling limitation. Uh, in fact, most of the bulk material will have a tremendous challenge going down to a thickness of 0 0.9 nanometer. Now that's a given for a monolayer of these TMDs, they're of the order of 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 nanometer. Uh, so remember that when it comes to the channel, we have to use a monolayer of 2D materials. If you go to two or three layer, we immediately fall outside the scope of IRDS. So, uh, now that is not true when it comes to the contact areas. Contact areas can still be thick because that may help in minimizing the contact resistance. So let's see what have been done uh, in contact resistance minimization. So here is a chart. In fact, if you go to the Stanford website, they have created a very nice uh, uh, platform uh, where you can see what are the latest trends and progress in terms of contact resistance to this uh, 2D material. Uh, and I think many of you are already aware of this uh, work, uh, which was published uh, last year in Nature, uh, where bismuth contacts were utilized uh, in order to get to a contact resistance of 123 ohm micrometer on MOS2. And this is already kind of very good and meeting the requirement for high performance computing. Uh, but I'd like to warn you that uh, this is a very good demonstration, but the contact resistance are uh, not yet solved. And the reason for that is this contact resistance number has been achieved for a very large carrier concentration. And this type of carrier concentration uh, is not really possible when you are using an intrinsic channel material. The reason they have been able to achieve this is because we have a backgated device. And in the backgated device, you can control the channel underneath the contact and really create a very high carrier concentration by using electrostatics. So, now, in terms of a real MOSFET, that will not be possible. What you eventually have to do, you have to come up with a degenerate doping scheme for these 2D materials, achieving you know, carrier concentration very high underneath this source and the drain contact in order to really mitigate the contact resistance problem. Okay, and then you can definitely use bismuth contact, but remember bismuth contact is only for MOS2, which is an N-type material. The contact metal that gives me such a low contact resistance for a P-type material, is still not known. And whether just doing metal work function engineering is going to get us to that point is uh, a, a thousand dollar, you know, I mean, it's a million dollar question. Uh, so, and we do not really have good PFETs uh, to start with uh, uh, as of now. Uh, and, and that's not all actually about the contacts. So let's say we found the magic metal or magic material, which can really give me a low contact resistance. At the end of the day, when you're talking about really scaled FETs, you also need to scale your contact lengths. Your contacts cannot be 100 nanometer or even one micrometer long when your channel is 10 nanometer. That simply defies the principal logic of scaling. So contact scaling is also going to be equally important. And when you scale the contacts, uh, a fundamental limitation comes in, as you can see that for scaled contact, the contact resistance simply shoots up. So therefore the goal is to achieve this resistance number for a scaled contact, right? And therefore the solution is still far from being reached. Uh, gate lengths of less than 10 nanometers. So, Tashi, I have a question. That's yes, good. Murtaza, yeah, tell me. So, so you remember some time ago, there was this idea of having edge contact to graphene. Yep. They started with graphene and then it was expanded to MOS2 and other 2D materials. And I haven't been plugged in. So do you know if uh, that would give you any better results? Because that probably solves your contact scaling issue because the contact would be very tiny. 
Right, Mortaz. I think you are absolutely right. I mean, uh, this uh, contact itching could give us some advantage. I am not sure whether it's going to completely resolve the issue. Uh, what I can tell you is that the best way to resolve this issue is to find a degenerate doping scheme so that you know you can create this N plus I, N plus, or P plus I, P plus structure like a conventional uh, MOSFET. Uh, now, whether we will be able to do it substitutionally or by using some charge transfer layer uh, remains open. You know, uh, The other thing is, I mean, what you're talking about is age injection, right? I mean, age injection is fine to a certain extent. I mean, if I can create some kind of a pattern contacts, if I can create more uh, volume for the contact, that's all good for large contacts. Now, if you think about a scaled contact, where this contact length itself is like 10 or 20 nanometer, I really do not know, you know, how much advantage I will get by, you know, uh, etching small holes into the contact. Uh, now, there has been hypotheses where people say that we can completely think about age contacts, right? So there, there is no transfer lens, and, and this particular fundamental problem doesn't even arise. Uh, but that still remains to be completely seen whether that is possible for uh, TMDs. It has been shown for graphene for sure, but I'm not very sure about the TMDs. So. Uh, and at the end of the day, you know, I mean, the other question is, where am I going to get this uh, contact to the whole branch? Essentially, how do I inject into the valence band of this 2D material, right? So how am I going to get a P-type FET? Uh, and, and that has to do again with the short key barrier, right? Because the Fermi level pinning in this 2D material at the contact happens, you know, either near the conduction band or mid-gap. How do I pin my Fermi level in the valence band, right? So, so, so I think... Uh, it's, it's a much larger question. I mean, there are like one solution, you know, I mean, uh, there are like solutions here and there, but really a comprehensive solution to mitigate the contact resistance is, is not there. You know, I mean, if that answers your question, I mean, it's still an open yeah, challenge. I, I, just, I just wanted to know if uh, that would give you, I, I don't know, I haven't followed the literature. It will give me some edge, but I, I feel like the community right now believes, you know, I mean, is that the best way to go for, you know, solving this contact issue uh, is uh, to have degenerate doping in one way or the other. I see. That, that yeah. will mitigate it. Right. That answers my question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Murtaza, for the interesting question. You know, I mean, it's a very pertinent one. Now, uh, now uh, going back to the other requirements, you know, the gate lengths of less than 10 nanometer. Uh, in academic settings, it has been demonstrated. Even IMAC has been able to achieve, uh, you know, gate lengths uh, very close to 10 nanometer. Even uh, I think uh, our group uh, have been very recently able to demonstrate very close to that number. Uh, but in the industry, you know, you cannot use EVM lithography and there it's completely a lithography problem. So I think uh, Germany probably have to make some good lithography tools, which can give us uh, uh, this get lens less than 10 nanometer. Uh, so I think it is possible to do, but there are lithography challenges over there, uh, which uh, at academia, I don't think people are trying to resolve. It is mostly a problem at the industrial level, you know, PSMC, Intel, those are the folks who are trying to resolve it. And I think they will be able to do it. Now comes to the on current, you know, so on current requirement is one milliamps per micrometer. Now, if I look into the recent results, uh, uh, you can see that uh, there are two regimes of these uh, 2D material FETs. Uh, if you are really long channel, more than one micrometer, you will be limited by the mobility. Uh, but once your channel length becomes less than 100 nanometer, and if you're talking about really ultra scale devices, the mobility is really not something that we care about. What we again care about is a contact resistance. And what you can see over here is that the projected number, even with the contact resistance as I has like 500 ohm micrometer, you can reach uh, this number of one milliamps per micrometer. In fact, there has been a really experimental demonstration showing currents in MOS to FETs up to uh, almost uh, uh, 800 microamps per micrometer. Uh, but again, this has been demonstrated only for N-type FETs, uh, P-type, the number is way less. Uh, I think the most recent result uh, from Appenzeller's group in Purdue shows 300 micrograms per micrometer in monolayer tungsten selenide. Uh, and our group has demonstrated in uh, exfoliated WSE2, which is of the order of 100 micrograms per micrometer, but that is multi-layer tungsten selenide. Uh, so there are uh, still challenges in type, terms of getting this high current for P-type FETs. N-type FETs are more comfortable that we can reach that number. Uh, the next uh, challenge is essentially the off current and the off current primarily is coming from the gate leakage. Uh, so we have to essentially minimize the uh, gate tunneling current. Now it has been a real struggle to grow high quality, ultra thin, 
a high K and craft free dielectric on the 2D material. There has been a lot of uh, studies where people have done some kind of a surface treatment, uh, you know, some kind of an oxygen replacement, uh, ALD process modification. I mean, plasma enhanced ALD appears to be much more gentler and tend to create a better interface, but it has its own to struggle as well. People have used, even our group uses seed layer, but the seed layer typically introduces a trappy uh, dielectric layer at the interface, which may not be good. Uh, and there are also other uh, approaches in getting a high quality dielectric uh, on top of the 2D material. And I think there has been really good progress and uh, really it looks promising at this point of time that we will be able to really get a very uh, good quality ultra thin dielectric on top of our 2D material. So gate leakage is, going to be achievable. Uh, it's not going to be very difficult. And then finally comes to the device reliability. And here I want to point out the fact that uh, uh, I personally feel that direct growth of this 2D material on the device uh, application substrate is going to be a challenge. Because generally this sulfur and selenium precursors tend to damage the underlying oxide material or the substrate uh, and uh, you tend to be better off by transferring this 2D material from the growth substrate to the device fabrication substrate. And that essentially, sub, I mean, what we feel, at least from our own experience, uh, you know, kind of living this 2D material, you know, transferring this 2D materials every now and then, is that transfer process remains a major bottleneck in terms of the device to device variability, reliability, and all those things. Now, there have been a lot of progress in this field. If you can think about you know, the uh, weight-free transfer, dry transfer, roll-to-roll -roll transfer. In fact, we have written a review article. If you're interested, you can think, you can go and see that, you know, what are the all possible transfer techniques available to get a damage-free, mechanically damage-free, clean, you know, resist-free transfers. Uh, but it has to develop at scale, right? We are talking about transferring uh, 2D materials from 300 millimeter wafer, growth wafer to 300 millimeter, uh, you know, device fabrication wafer. And, 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 and that seems to be a big bottleneck, uh, but I think that it is resolvable. It, it's over the long term, if we invest more time and effort uh, uh, over the next course of, you know, two or three years, we should be able to solve this device to device variation problem. And of course, I mean, there are device to device variation, which is also coming from the growth, right? So the growth also has to be perfected. But right now, our feeling is that the main bottleneck is the transfer process, and that has to be perfect. So no matter what, uh, I think there is a lot of promise uh, of the 2D material to be able to, at some point of time, replace or even augment uh, the silicon CMOS. Uh, and I think a uh, uh, lot of companies like Intel, you know, TSMC, are you know, seriously interested in this 2D material, and we, which shows that, you know, we are not doing something that is just for uh, the fun of research. Uh, they, it really has some technological promise. So. Now, uh, these are kind of some of the long-term goals for the 2D materials. But in the short term, I also see that the 2D materials could have an application niche in uh, Internet of Things. So, uh, and, and these Internet of Things devices doesn't really require to be very high performance. So, uh, there's a huge market for these devices. You know, uh, if you can see that by 2023, next year, it's going to reach almost like $55 billion. You know, I mean, just the device part of the Internet of Things. So, uh, now, what is really required for these uh, IoT uh, devices is that they have to be low power. They have to be multifunctional. And if you can somehow integrate some smart uh, uh, sensing or neuromorphic computing uh, uh, with these devices. These devices are typically called edge devices. Uh, and they're looking for uh, this paradigm where you can integrate compute with memory or sensing with compute or sensing with security and storage, right? So the so typical requirement for the IoT edge devices is not high performance, but multifunctionality. For example, these IoT edge devices are going to sense the information from the surrounding. Uh, then they are going to use those sensed information to do some local computation. Uh, they may send this information to the cloud, but often uh, it will benefit by having some on-chip processors, uh, which doesn't have to be again very high, uh, high, uh, uh, you know, efficient or high, high, highly uh, uh, resources. So, uh, I mean, and then you have to also store this information, you know, locally, and if possible, you want to introduce also some kind of a security on these chips. So, and and this area is something I feel the 2D materials can really satisfy in the short term. And let me now show you, you know, what we are essentially trying to do along these uh, 
uh, aspect. And here we are actually uh, deriving the inspiration from biology because if you think about all these natural animals, you know, what they do for their living is simply, you know, sensing the information, processing it using their tiny brains, you know, store some of this information for their learning so that they can be successful in their future uh, hunting for prey or, you know, I mean, uh, escaping from predators or finding their mates. Uh, and at the same time, you know, uh, they do it quite securely. Uh, right, so so we are essentially drawing the inspiration from biology uh, because these tiny brains are extremely energy efficient and they are very task specific. And this is where we feel the two D materials can make really uh, 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 inroad. Now, let me show you a quick video which gives you uh, a little bit of philosophy of our group's work in this area, and then I will get back to the technical talk again. It is pretty well known that animals can actually rely on their sensory skills in order to locate prey, uh, find their predators and even find their mates, uh, which ultimately determines their evolutionary success. Now, what is very fascinating and sometimes very humbling to us is that they do it with minimum amount of resources. They consume very little amount of energy and their tiny brains can perform computational tasks, uh, which are essentially very difficult even for the modern day computers. We, we are trying to mimic their uh, functionality into our devices and just learning about biology, how, how uh, animals around us behave is very interesting for me. Nature is not only beautiful, but also it is very smart and this is very deep rooted in everyone who's working in this group. Uh, we're doing something brand new. Uh, we're connecting nature and technology in a way that no one else quite has before. So the primary focus of our research is to develop an unified platform for the next generations of ultra low power and artificially intelligent sensors, which can not only sense the data from the environment, but can also process that information. It can actually store that information. And at the end of the day, it can also communicate that information among each other without compromising the security of the information. So whether we're trying to sense a virus, sense an earthquake, sense changes in the climate or critical risks that we face, Having better sensors means better information, and better information means better outcomes. These new sensors that we are developing in this era of Internet of Things is that there is so many of them. In fact, there will be almost like close to a trillion sensors by the year 2030. Uh, and each of them are going to consume energy. And the total energy consumption is going to reach almost 20% of the total energy expenditure that the human population uses. And unless and until we essentially solve this problem and make these uh, sensors energy efficient, we will not be able uh, to cope with these energy challenges. Really, if we want to move towards a sustainable future, we need to make sure that we make these sensors as energy efficient as possible. Hope you have enjoyed this talk. And if you are interested in knowing a little bit more about you know, the, the main philosophy behind our research group, uh, I recently gave a TEDx talk uh, at uh, TEDx PSU. Uh, and that's also available in the YouTube. So uh, you're welcome to you know, also uh, listen to that talk. I mean, it's a very high level talk talking about uh, this bio-inspired computation for the uh, next generation of sustainable devices. So. Uh, now let me go uh, into the technical part of this sensing and I think first I would like to introduce this new idea of uh, 2D MEM transistors. We have heard about MEM resistors, we have heard about transistors and what we are trying to develop in our group is a new technology which we call 2D MEM transistors. So, uh, now what is very unique about these 2D MEM transistors is that they are definitely transistors and uh, these are made out of this uh, ultra thin 2D material so, uh, but they also combine memory with the transistor functionality. So uh, now we can build this 2D MEM transistors using the monolayer MOS2 that we received from 2DCC uh, from Dr. Red Wing's group, uh, as well as from uh, Dr. Robinson's group, which are vanadium WAC2. And one of these material is an N-type material, the other is a P-type material. So we can create complementary 2D transistors. So uh, now the unique aspect about these 2D complementary transistors is also that we can program them which is very similar to a mem resistor. In the mem resistor, you can apply a programming and erase voltage to set the state of the mem resistor. We can do the exact same thing with the mem transistor as well. In this case, we apply you know, large magnitude of voltage pulses to the gate. And if we apply a negative pulse, then you can see that the device moves from a low conductance state to a high conductance state. And if we apply positive voltage to the gate, it moves from a high conductance state to a low conductance state. But in any given conductance state, 
we also keep the transistor functionality, which means that it has a large on-off ratio for any given state. So these devices are almost like an artificial synapse where you essentially store the information, but also at the same time, they could be used as neurons, which performs all the mathematical functionalities. And once you program this device into a particular state, they can retain that state uh, over a reasonable period of time. Uh, uh, it is also very similar to you know, long-term and short-term plasticity that you will find uh, in the uh, uh, brains of uh, many animals, right? And we can do that for both the N-type MOS2 as well as the P-type vanadium doped WSE2. So therefore, we have combined this transistor functionality with memory property to obtain this 2D MEM transistor technology. Now, what can we do with this 2 MEM transistor technology? We can now, of course, design digital primitives, for example, inverters and all the logic gates that I have told you before, as well as the neuromorphic primitives. So because some of you may be aware of the artificial neural networks, and in the artificial neural networks, you need different types of neurons, like sigmoid neuron, Gaussian neurons, and we can essentially make these available. Uh, on top of being able to achieve synaptic functionality in our device. So, and since we can program these individual devices, we can actually make them reconfigurable. So we can have reconfigurable inverter, we can have reconfigurable sigmoid, and a Gaussian synapse where we can actually tune the standard deviation mean and the amplitude of the Gaussian function. Now, what is the use of having these kind of computational facilities? Uh, we can actually then start to solve some of the most difficult combinatorial optimization problems using these 2D devices. For example, we have developed an annealing accelerator for the Ising spin system. Now the Ising spin system is essentially a system of spin which has both up and down spin, as well as the interaction between the spins could be either ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic. If it's an antiferromagnetic interaction, then the two spins wants to be aligned in the opposite direction. If it's a ferromagnetic interaction, then it wants to align in the same direction. Now, Ising spin system is very unique because it has an energy landscape, which has many, many local minimas and only four global minimas. And it is always very difficult to find the global minima when you have many uh, local minima. So, and this is a combinatorial optimization problem, which means that as the size of the spin system increases, that is the number of spins increases, this problem becomes very difficult to solve in a polynomial time. The time simply explodes. So what we have shown is that we can then use our 2D FET-based uh, complementary devices and use this uh, uh, in-memory computation to accelerate some kind of an algorithm, which we call the simulated annealing to solve this problem. And we can accelerate finding the solution by orders and orders of magnitude, right? So that is the advantage of using this uh, uh, unique 2D MEM transistor technology to solve some of the hardest computational problems. And we have been able to do that. Um, now, in addition to solving combinatorial problems, we find that there is a unique possibility with the 2D material, which is also combining sensing with computation. And I think most of you are aware about the fact that monolayer of 2D materials, mostly the TMDs are direct band gap, and therefore they're optically active. You see a lot of PL response from these materials. So, and they are generally active or responsive to light in the visible range, as you can see over here. In fact, their responsivity values could be very high. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and it's just not about the photoresponse. These devices also show persistent photoconductivity or something which we call gate tunable uh, photocurrent uh, because of the charges that can tr uh, get trapped in the uh, MOS2 alumina interface when you expose it to light. The photocarriers uh, can be trapped and that leads to some kind of a, a photo getting effect or persistent photoconductivity. That can essentially be exploited to design you know, now new kinds of devices where you combine sensing with computing. And I'm going to show you one example uh, where we have essentially published a recent article of uh, uh, designing a collision detector uh, based on these MOS2 devices. So, now, when we talk about collision detection, you know, if you think about uh, these insects, uh, uh, they move in large swarms, you know, and uh, uh, for example, this locust, uh, there are like millions of locusts in a given swarm, but when they move together, they hardly collide with each other. So these insects are amazing in terms of detecting collision. Now, it's very interesting to look into the neural network of these uh, insects, and you will find that there's a single neuron, which is called this lobular giant movement detector neuron, which helps the locust to avoid collision. 
the way it avoids collision is by using you know two visual stimuli one is the angular projection of the object which is approaching the locust eye and the other is the angular velocity now this lgmd neuron has two branches this blue branch over here uses the angular velocity information and creates an excitatory response while the red dendritic branch uses the angular uh, projection information and creates an inhibitory response in this branch and then the lgmd neuron does a multiplicative operation and that creates a non monotonic spiking response and you can see that the spike frequency becomes maximum right before the collision is going to take place so here it's a wonderful example of using a single neuron to perform a difficult computational task and because it is only one neuron the energy efficiency is enormous in fact it uses only you know fem to joules of energy in order to perform this computational task now in the past people have tried to mimic the entire neural network of this uh, locus but that requires a lot of transistors capacitor is at a big footprint and therefore also consumes a lot of energy what we have been able to do is we have been able to mimic this lgmd neuron using a single mos2 transistor by exploiting its auto response uh, in order to create the excitatory phenomena and using this mem transistor action to create the inhibitory response and then combining the two to obtain collision detection capability so let me show you an uh, video demonstration first so here uh, you know we um, do a toy car which is uh, uh, essentially mounted with an led approaching the sensor what i'm going to show you is that what is the experience of the sensor when a car is on a collision course with it you will see that the intensity of the light that is falling on the sensor simply keeps increasing and it becomes maximum at the collision point so for example if two cars and are on collision course then the intensity of the light falling on the sensor is going to be very less when the two cars are far away from the collision but at the point of collision the intensity is maximum now let's see how our device is going to respond to such a looming stimuli when the cars are on collision course so uh, and here you can see that the response of the device or the photo car in the device keeps increasing monotonically now depending upon how fast the two cars are approaching you can either get an early response if the speed is very high or you can get a later response if the relative speed is very small but this response alone is not sufficient for you to detect the collision so what we do is at the same time we apply this mem transistive property and apply a programming voltage to the gate of the transistor to essentially have an inhibitory response where the response of the device or the current decreases over time now what happens if i combine the two responses you know when the limiting stimuli is present i apply a voltage programming train as well in that case the response of the device shows a non monotonic train and you can see that this minima occurs before the collision is going to take place so it is very similar to the escape response of the lgmd neuron and because we are using a single device uh, we can essentially detect the collision with ultra low power consumption so again you know this collision detector is going to be very important for many applications starting from autonomous vehicles you know flying drones or even rovers which are going to be deployed in in uh, extraterrestrial places right and and these are going to be edge devices so, and if we can really make ultra low power edge sensors for collision detector uh, then we will probably have a near term application of this to the material Uh, another example is essentially this biomimetic uh, uh, 2D transistor for performing audiomorphic uh, computation. Uh, this could be used for navigational purposes because barn owl essentially uses sound information to find the location of its prey, and it can do it with a precision of one to three degrees. So, now, sound localization typically is a very difficult task, uh, and the way it is performed is by having two ears on the two side of the brain. so whenever a sound comes from a particular direction there is a time difference between the sound reaching the right and the left ear now depending upon the head size of the animal this time difference could be of the order of hundreds of microseconds to a millisecond but the problem is the neurons in your brain can fire only every few milliseconds you are trying to solve a problem which is in hundreds of microsecond regime using tools which can only operate in millisecond regime so it's a difficult computational problem and the way the banawal has resolved is by using a very efficient neural architecture that transform the temporal information into a spatial map by using two types of neuron one is called the delay neuron which you know kind of conveys this uh, 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 sound information from the two sides of the brain 
and the other is a coincidence neuron which fires when it receives the information from the delay neuron which is in the top and the bottom at the same time. So let me show you how it is uh, happening. So let's say for example, if the sound is coming from straight ahead, it reaches both ears at the same time and then the coincidence is going to happen at the middle. However, if the sound comes, let's say for example, from the right side, it will reach the right ear first and the left ear later. So this propagation will happen more towards the lower branch and the, and the coincidence will occur more towards the left side. So by seeing where the coincidence is occurring, the barn owl can tell where did the sound came from, right? So it's a very efficient way of converting temporal information into a spatial map. And this is particularly what we have done using our 2D devices. We have created a similar device structure. Here we use a very interesting device, which we call the split gated device, but we don't only have a single split gate. We have multiple split gates with different spacing among the same. Uh, and, and then we use these uh, in order to create this kind of a coincident detector. So each of these split gates are coincident detectors. Uh, so the device essentially responds whenever there's two signals appearing at the same time on the top and the bottom split gate. Uh, but then if the coincidence occur at different split gate pairs, then the amount of response that I get is different. So the device performs a digital computation in this direction and an analog computation along the transport direction. And by doing that, we can recreate this coincidence map uh, that is found in the barn oil. And the advantage of that is now we can bit the uh, precision of the barn owl because these devices could be very, very small, right? We are using all our nanolithography tools uh, to create very small devices. And we can essentially tune the device parameters to make sure that our precision can really outperform what the barn owl can do. Yeah, so that's another advantage of mimicking, you know, what is found already in nature. Now I'd like to, you know, switch gears a little bit. Uh, and start talking about uh, a different area, which is the hardware security. Uh, now, hardware security has become very important because in the recent time, you have probably seen a lot of uh, hacking, uh, reverse engineering, IP piracy uh, going on uh, in the field. And this is going to be even more critical for the IoT edge devices. Uh, and and uh, these edge devices, we are all carrying, right? And we are essentially putting a lot of our personal information in these edge devices. So you really want to make sure that this device that you're putting into these devices are secure. Uh, and if we can do it at the hardware level, we can really make sure that they are very low power. Now, there are multiple facets of hardware security. And the first facet is, you know, authentication. You need to make sure that the device that you're using can be authenticated using a secure key. And that is what we call the physically unclonable function. Uh, and that requires physically unclonable function. At the same time, you also want to prevent, you know, recycling or remarking of the ICs. Uh, you will be very surprised to know that almost 60 to 80% of the ICs used in the defense are actually recycled. Uh, uh, now, the problem of using recycling ICs is that they're more vulnerable to failure. And if you're talking about mission critical, uh, you know, applications, so they could be really uh, uh, disastrous, right? If you're using uh, recycled ICs. So, and anti-counterfeit is a way to prevent uh, IC recycling. Similarly, you know, right now, the semiconductor industry is a global uh, chain. You are essentially making the devices at a place and you're you know, designing at a different location. So it's a globally distributed process and not all the actors which are involved in the IC design are actually trustworthy. So they can reverse engineer the IC. So if you can somehow prevent the reverse engineering using camouflaging techniques, uh, that will be really beneficial. And at the end of the day, you want to always protect your intellectual property. And here, the watermarking scheme that I'm going to propose are going to be useful. So what I'm going to show is that the 2D materials are poised very uniquely to solve many of the hardware security questions that exist uh, uh, in the field. Uh, let me first give you one example, which is this physically unclonable function. And in the recent year, we have been able to use graphene-based uh, field effect transistors, uh, which are reconfigurable and also resilient to machine learning attacks to be used as a physically unclonable function. Now, uh, let's go a little bit uh, into the basics of physically unclonable function. Physically unclonable function is essentially a physical object which has some disorder, uh, which is easy to fabricate, but very difficult to duplicate. Uh, now, there are certain properties of a physically unclonable function. So if you have a challenge uh, to this physically unclonable function, it will show a response. But if the puff is different, then the response will be different. 
right? But at the same time, if you use the same puff, but change your challenge, then the response should be different. So these are the two criteria of physically unclonable function. Now, the first physically unclonable function was demonstrated using uh, optics. So where this puff was essentially a suspended media of some nanoparticles. So when you sh uh, shine a laser from a particular angle, it will create a speckle pattern on the screen. And the speckle pattern is going to be absolutely random because your nanoparticle distribution in this suspended liquid is going to be random. Now, if you change this nanoparticle solution, the speckle pattern will change. That is almost like you change the puff. You keep the laser orientation the same, the speckle pattern, which is the response, is going to change. At the same time, if you keep the solution the same, but change the orientation of the laser, which is essentially changing the challenge, then also your response will also change, right? So these are the two properties of physically unclonable function. Now, there has been in the past a demonstration of puff using silicon-based devices, but they're really very energy consuming and silicon devices really are not that random. What we have been able to show is that these graphene devices uh, uh, have some inherent disorders uh, when you uh, make field effect transistors out of this. So, and that comes out of because of many types of disorder. It could be either transfer related, fabrication related, growth related, uh, or to a certain extent, you know, having grain boundaries in your frame. So, and, and that leads to a lot of variation in carrier mobility, drag voltage, or you know, the intrinsic carrier concentration or the disorder parameter. So when you measure a large population of these graphene devices, you see a lot of device-to-device -device variation. Now, the device-to-device -device variation is not really very good in terms of you know, the, uh, the very large scale integration application, but that could be very good for this security application. Uh, so what we found is that this device-to-device -device variation actually follows a random Gaussian distribution in most of these parameters, uh, and therefore they are really a very high entropy source. So, so what we do is we make an array of graphene devices. Let's say, for example, eight graphene devices. Eight devices will show unique device characteristics. Then we essentially use the grain voltage as a challenge and the current as a response. So current response from each device is going to be unique. We take those current response and use an analog digital converter to convert those current into some digital keys. Once we have the keys, we can then test for how random those keys are, which means that how random is the distribution of ones and zeros in that bit stream. And we found that the entropy is almost close to one, which is near ideal. Uh, in fact, we also looked into Hamming distance and correlation coefficient, which are essentially uh, some of the matrix that people use in order to uh, you know, demonstrate the uniqueness and uncorrelated nature of PUFF. Uh, these are some of the matrix that has to be satisfied in order to prove that your GFET is a source of real randomness. And we were able to show almost near ideal values for most of this benchmarking matrix. So, the another important aspect about the graphene-based PUFF is that they're reconfigurable. Uh, and that originates from the memoristic property of graphene field effect transistor. When you apply a large drain bias to the graphene FET, they get reconfigured. They change from ambipolar characteristics and become more P-type. Uh, and when you reconfigure them, there is also a certain level of randomness. So uh, it is almost like if you have lost your password, you can reconfigure it just by applying a voltage, right? Uh, the same thing applies for these graphene devices. But once we reconfigure, we do not lose the entropy or uniqueness or the uh, correlation among uh, FETs. So, uh, which means that uh, this is the first demonstration of a reconfigurable puff uh, uh, based on uh, GFET. Um, at the same time, we also showed that these GFET pops are resilient to machine learning attacks because nowadays people have a lot of computational power. They can run, you know, uh, very sophisticated machine learning algorithms and try to really hack into your password. What we have found is that this kind of machine learning attacks are going to be uh, really uh, non-useful uh, when it comes to decoding graphene-based pop devices. In fact, we have looked into uh, generative adversarial neural networks, which are one of the most sophisticated neural network in terms of uh, you know, predicting uh, the future. Uh, and we have found that even using those kind of networks, you cannot really uh, get any access to the GFET best puff. So. Uh, so it really shows that these devices are remarkable in terms of their strength uh, uh, in giving us the real, you know, true randomness. So. Uh, another interesting application is the camouflaging. As I told, this is very good in terms of preventing reverse engineering. 
and camouflaging is a technique that again the animals use uh, to hide uh, from their predators or to hunt for prey. For example, here you are seeing a bark of a tree, and there's a spider, but it is completely camouflaged in the surrounding. A similar technique can be used for the integrated circuit, where you make circuits, but then you kind of create some kind of a dummy contact. Uh, whether it is, it, it, this dummy contact is working or not working will not be available uh, to your advisory. So they will not know what is the real functionality of the circuit. Now, this is something that we can do very inherently with the 2D material. For example, here I am showing you some optical images of 2D flakes, uh, and they look optically identical. So if somewhere to look at it and tell me if there is any difference, you know, they will be fooled to tell you that, oh, these two flakes look exactly alike, so they should be functionally the same but they're actually not. What we have done is that over the period of time, we have exposed you to some oxygen plasma. And when you expose these 2D materials to oxygen plasma, you convert the top layers of these 2D materials into transition metal oxides. Now these transition metal oxides are transparent, therefore the appearance of this 2D material does not change. But at the same time, these transition metal oxides are actually P-type dopant for the underlying TMD. So we can start with an N-type material, but then this material will become P-type. So over here, this flake is N-type, while this flake is over a P-type. So now if I go ahead and make a transistor device, then I will know whether this device is an N-type FET or a P-type FET, but someone who is just eavesdropping, you know, a reverse engineer will not know what is the exact functionality of the device. So I've been able to camouflage my device functionality. In fact, I could essentially make half of the device N-type and half of the device P-type and I can create a diode and still it will have the same appearance as a transistor. So in fact, I could create resistor, diode and transistor and yet I will not know what is the exact functionality of this device. And that's the unique capability that this 2D material offer for me to camouflage my entire integrated circuit term. So uh, I got a question. So yes, sure. this is gonna be camouflaged against optical microscopy. How about like some other types of characterization techniques? That is an excellent question. Uh, so if you think about the characterization techniques, most of the way the reverse engineering works is that they will take some kind of an imaging, you know, optical imaging or SEM imaging. You are right, if I go and now look into some XPS, let's say for example, I will be able to see the signature of the oxygen, right? But if you think about an integrated circuit, there will be like 1 billion transistors, right? And uh, even if you do an XPS of these, each of these devices, right, it will be, I mean, you will have to do a massive resources. You need to have a massive resources in order to understand what each of device is actually functioning as, right? So, so it's a problem of scale. At the end of the day, if I give my advisory infinite amount of resources, that person will be able to tell, you know, what is really going on. If I allow him to measure each and every device, of course, you will be able to find out whether the device is an N-type or a P-type transistor. But when you scale it up, in a single device to a billion transistor, it will be almost impossible for a reverse engineer with finite resources to find out what is really going on in the circuit. Uh, if that makes sense, right? At the end of the day, of course, if you do all sorts of measurements, you will be able to find out what is going on. Does that make sense? Sure, sure. You're just trying to make uh, larger barriers to your advisories to, to catch yeah. your work. So, okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then I think uh, uh, one last thing I would like to mention is also this watermarking and anti-counterfeit. Uh, we're using some of the uh, you know optical properties of the 2D material to create unique watermarks. Uh, as I mentioned, you know the 2D materials have this unique photo response or the photo gating effect. Uh, so if a device is initially in the off state, you know you will not measure any current. But then if I expose it to light, then the device characteristics will start shifting. And as the device characteristics start shifting, you know, I will start seeing some particular pattern evolving, uh, which will not be possible if this material was not 2D material. So I can create unique watermarks in my IC. So in a court of law, nobody can challenge me and I can show that uh, uh, these are going to work. I mean, if you're interested, you can read our ACS Nano paper. Uh, I'm going to not talk into detail about that. Uh, and again, we can use this memoristic property of this uh, 2D mem transistors to create, you know, natural clocks and natural counters in order to prevent uh, this IC recycling. Uh, so with that, I think uh, I'm probably going to stop here because I think we have probably 10 minutes left.
I would like to summarize. Uh, so what we are essentially trying to do in the short term is to exploit these unique physical uh, properties of these 2D materials to develop this uh, you know, new paradigm of computation, sensing, storage, and security devices, which draws essentially inspiration from the brain. And in the long term, we are essentially trying to see whether the 2D materials can really compete with the silicon technology and can eventually uh, replace or augment uh, the silicon MOSFET both at the front end as well as the back end. Um, and if you're interested, you can read our uh, recent papers. So with that, uh, I would like to conclude and take any questions that you have. Thank you, Saptarshi. Anybody who would like to ask a question, please unmute. If you don't want to ask it audibly, you can go ahead and chat in the chat box to Kevin. Okay. 